We are on Twitch. We are live. You can come join us if you want. If not, that's cool. Just leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Um, if we go to a live and you happen to miss it, this is where all the highlights will be. Don't forget, we also got the Discord. Links down in the description for all of the things I'm mentioning right now. Um, oh, this is not the Discord. This is the Patreon, my bad. But we do got the Discord as well. This is from Lad Bible TV or LA. Lad, I don't know how to. I'm going to go Lad Bible. 19 minutes with ex gang member on teen murders. 27,000 pound robberies and prison. Okay. Let's talk about it. Bobby, where did you grow up and how was your early childhood? Um, I was born in Congo, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, um, known then as Zaire. Um, came to the UK um, aged three. I grew up originally in Dulwich for like the first maybe year in Britain. And then where I mainly grew up was uh, Peckham, South East London on the Gloucester Estate. And what were you like as a kid? Um, I was energetic. Um, I was chatty. Um, and quite intelligent. I was always in the top set in school. Very good at football. Um, from in year four, I actually played for the year six team. Growing up in Peckham um, at the beginning was fun. I was oblivious to where exactly I was. Um, I grew up in a Gloucester estate, but at the time when you're seven, eight, nine years old, you don't see the crime. You just see older people hanging around in the streets. We don't know what they're doing, but we used to go outside every summer, play football, running around. And as a kid, you never really know where you at. <laughs> but you know where that come from? That come from the, the people, the big homies on the block. They don't let you really know. They try to keep it away from the kids until they're until they that age where they could, you know, do what they... Not saying I condone any of that. The transition was when they knocked down the Gloucester Estate in 97. We moved to the new sort of building that meant to be much nicer, which it was um, in terms of appearance. But that's when I moved into year seven. And that's when I started finding out, oh, this is where I am in Peckham. So you, the, the gangs, the, the crime, the violence, you, you become more aware of it. You were recruited by the Peckham boys. Can you speak about how that kind of first came to be? Peckham boys, gang in South East London. Yeah, I mean, with the Peckham boys, it was a thing that where my older brother was quite affiliated with them already. And he used to come back home, tell me stories, and he used to think like, wow, who are these guys? Because everyone had nicknames, so it's like that. Shout out to Zach, man. Subscriber, appreciate it. Avengers or the uh, sort of mutant hero turtles, whatever it is. So it was literally, I was still kind of wanting to play football. So year seven, year eight, and the majority of year nine, I kind of kept away from that. I saw them, I thought they was cool people, and I, I was known to quite a few of them, but nothing where I was kind of involved. It was an incident one day, I borrowed, well, I say borrowed, I took my brother's hat without his knowledge and um, I was walking down the street heading home and where our house is by the Peckham Pole swimming pool and the library is where everyone hangs around. So we live just on the, the house, the new build, build houses there. And as I was walking by, one of the Peckham boys um, came over and said, oh, let me see that hat. Usually when someone says, let me see that hat or let me see that phone, whatever it is, they're trying to rob you. Yeah, yeah, it's over with. It's <laughs> the same way in Chicago. If you're on a train, if you're in any public space and somebody says, you got a phone I can use? Hell no, I ain't got no phone you can use. Do I look like I just let people use my phone? I got a phone for me, not for you. Hey, that's how aggressive I used to be. Oh, hey, then. Can I use your phone? Boy, go on somewhere. And I look like I got goofy written across my forehead. I'm like, no, we can't see the hat. What are you doing? Someone says, let me see that hat or let me see that phone, whatever it is. They're trying to rob you. And I'm like, no, we can't see the hat. What are you doing? And they're like, give me the hat. Then someone else who knew who I was came over and said, oh, what are you doing? That's Carly's little brother. He's like, oh, I didn't know. Oh, you're one of us, man. And that was my recruitment process. So the next day when I'm walking past, they're like, where are you going? Come. And literally, I was a Peckham boy from there. For anyone who might not know, can you just kind of explain, like, what the Peckham boys are and kind of how the gang structure in, like, yeah. South London works? Yeah, I mean, uh, the Peckham boys were... Um, I mean, 
people don't like to say the word gang, but it was a gang. Um, we used to run around terrorizing other areas. Other areas just run around trying to terrorize us. The older lot, uh, there's, there's a hierarchy. So there used to be the PMS, which is the Pekka Mans. Then there was the YPB, which is the young Peckham boys. Then there was the YYPB, which I was part of, which is the younger, younger Peckham boys. And even my, goes down to the PKs at the time, which was the Peckham kids. And some of the stuff we would do at our age was very trivial. You said, do they be G-checking girls in Chicago? I'm a girl that grew up in South London, but never been g check. Not really. I, I, it's like a touchy, like, it's like, if you were a girl and you were involved and, and you were clearly involved, then yeah. Because people are gonna know about you because you stand out already. So as soon as they see you coming, they on that with you. They're going to get on your ass. They're going to get on your bumper. So other than that, like, females, they mess with the other side. And the guys from the other side, that the females, the opposite side of the females that are getting messed with, they, they try to pull them because it's like a slap in the other side's face. You know, it's things like that. I don't know. Stuff. Like, would be your petty street robberies. And then you'll sell drugs for the older lot. And then we'll go to places like Deptford and New Cross, have beef with the ghetto boys from there. And then I think as you get older, that's when the ghetto boy street gang based in South London. Criminality is what sort of changes and becomes more serious. Uh, mainly my thing at the time was rubbing phones. We used to go rubbing people's phones and you would get about 80 pound, 100 pound a phone. So as a 14, 15 year old, that's a lot of money. I can go now and buy the latest um, night train as well as before. It's my parents would buy me that one pair of trainer, which I would have had for the whole year. Now I can go and buy three, four without their, their kind of knowledge. So I wouldn't say it was making crazy amount of money, but it was money indeed. When we kind of got to like 16, 17, that's when you start selling drugs. And with that, you're kind of making a bit more money. So you may be making like 400, 500 pound weekly kind of thing, yeah. For me, the crime sort of escalated. Sounds like London, like it was more on a money thing. Chicago be on some other stuff, man. That's not what they use in 16, 17, 15 year olds for some of them, but it's another purpose. I tried to go to college so many times. So my first year Allegedly. I went to uh, Richmond um, College and I studying A-levels, four A-levels, because of my behavior and stuff. I had issues with my parents at home and then I left and I was 17 at the time. And I remember I was playing for Fisher Athletic at the time. They're now called just Fisher FC, but Fisher Athletic at the time. Uh, got a part-time job at Peacocks and then was also selling weed. So I was doing all of those things at 17. Peacocks are British high season street clothes. By myself living, living on my own and it just it became too much. So something had to go and it was um, education first. So I quit education at the time. Um, I quit my job at Peacocks and I was trying to concentrate on the football and selling drugs. And it just came to a point one day, one of my friends told me, oh, I got a security van robbery. I'm like, security van, what's that? Like, oh, those people carry the suitcases with the money. I said, I'm not doing that, that's crazy. I can understand that little things we do, but you're telling me, I said, no, nah, I'm not doing it. The next day, he went and done it and he came back with 10,000 pounds in cash. And I was like, that's the first time I've ever seen that amount of cash. And then my head was spun. I was like, when are we next going? Mm. I remember in 2006, I started wanting to get back involved in football. It's sad, man. Not even a, not even on the gang life, but like in general, like people don't believe it till they see it. I kind of stopped and I signed not for um, Ilford um, FC. I was playing in reserves, first team reserve, first team reserve, and I was doing quite well. Um, I was getting a lot of goals, and then I remember at the time um, a guy, a gentleman called Mark Butler from Ashford Town, Middlesex, uh, signed me, and I remember I was making my debut for Ashford Town Middlesex and we were going to play against Folkestone FC and on this Friday I met with some old friends from Peckham who was also doing the robberies. They had planned a robbery the next day uh, with one of my friends, uh, Javari Crichton and I said, yeah, no, nah, I can't come and make my debut. They're like, you sure? Like, yeah, yeah, you guys go. The next day um, I'm on a, a coach with, with my team. Javari called me that day in the morning and he said, oh, I've done the robbery but I think these guys have tried to bump me. Uh, they tried to bump you, how? He's like, um, with, I've done the robbery, but they're saying that the money's not in, there's no money in there, but I'm trying to call them and they're not answering and so on. So he's like, I can see them as well. They're trying to pretend they're not there. So he said, oh, call your brother, see if you can sort it out. So I tried to call my brother and my brother said, oh, let me see what I can do. But I think Javari was quite impatient and he's gone on there and had an argument with him. And one of the 
guys have ended up um, stabbing him. So I remember one of the guys um, that I knew called me and said, oh my God, oh my God, I think Javari's dying. I think it's Javari's dying. I'm like, what do you mean? He said, he's on, he's on the floor, he's just being stabbed. His eyes are not open, his eyes are closed. Now I'm kind of facing two worlds because this world where I am right now is the football world where I'm not involved in any criminal. Trying to do the right thing. You sound like you were straddling that fence, low key. You feel like sometimes you gotta drop them friends, man, because they're just gonna pull you back into their life, like so. No one knows about my history or background, and now this is kind of infiltrating my, 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 my reality right now. So it's like I'm trying to keep calm, and people are kind of looking around because I'm kind of shy. Like, what do you mean he's dying? What do you mean he's dying? So people are looking around, like, what's going on? And I'm saying, look, call the ambulance, call the ambulance, make sure you call the ambulance. So I, 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 I kind of hung, uh, hung up the phone in my head. That you know what, the ambulance has come, he's made it, he's alive, and everything's gonna be cool once I finish the game. We lost 3 1 that day, I made my debut. Uh, but as soon as I switched on my phone, I saw so many messages and missed calls and voicemails, and I just knew, I just knew. So before I could even listen to them, I called my brother, my brother was like, Oh, I'm sorry, man, I'm sorry, and I just knew that Javari had been killed. Javari Kaiden stabbed to death at age 21. R.I.P. The killing of Javari sparked immediate gang retaliation. All because they tried to backdoor Javari over some money from a job. You see what I'm saying? There's no honor amongst thieves. Y'all went in there and did that together, then they tried to cut him out. And Javari wasn't gone. Two gunmen shot at 15-year-old boy in his bed. Believe him to be someone else. False mistaken identity. Police identified Bobby as a suspect of the... Dang! It went downhill quick! My brother's called me up. Don't go to my... Hey, Ice. My car's out of warranty, and I'm worried about a big auto repair bill. I have the answer. You need... Is this Alan Irison? What the heck? Now you know you ain't getting no cut in that barber shop. <laughs> My bad. I come. My brothers call me up. Don't go to mom's house in Peckham. Armed police are here looking for you. So I'm thinking, wow. And at this point, I had like lots of items in my house, but I didn't know the, the police didn't know where I lived. So um, I just panicked though. So I called a girl that I was seeing at the time as well. I said, look, come to my house quickly. I just piled. Um, all the new clothes and everything into her house, all the money into in, uh, to, to put it all in bin bags, told her to take it, all the um, drugs that I had that I was starting to sell again, put it all in there. She took them. Then I went over to my mum's, who was down the road, and see what the commotion was, and like, there was a helicopter there, on police there, and I've kind of gone to them, like, all right, guys, um, I'm who you're looking for, I'm Robert Kasenga. They're like, move, move. I'm like, no, I'm the guy you're looking for. They're like, oh, get down. They brought out their machine guns, like, get down, get down, get down. So I put, put me on the floor, had my hands behind my head, and they um, got me up, and an officer came over and said, yes, uh, we're arresting you on suspicion of murder. I'm like, what? Murder for what? They took me to... Um... You know what's crazy? Somebody gave his name up. Somebody gave that name, his name. They don't just come with that like that. They gotta have, like, a, they gotta have... They gotta have an inside guy. You just gonna come straight at me like, what you mean? <laughs> like somebody gave him that name. A police station in um, South London, Wolf Road Police Station. And at that point, like I was still being quite arrogant. Come like, you guys got the wrong guy. You're just wasting my time. You're wasting everyone's time here. Then two other officers approached me and they said, oh, um, we're from Flying Squad and we're arresting you for a conspiracy to rob. That's when my heart sunk. I was like, oh yeah. Cause I was definitely involved in robbery. So. But the next day, when they done all the interviews, the robberies they brought up had nothing to do with me. I'm like, oh, yeah, I was like, these robberies you guys said on this day, on this day, I was here, I was there, nothing to do with me. So I was released under, on, uh, on bail, under investigation. But at that point, I should have just stopped. Like, it's hot. But at that point, like you said... You yeah, all eyes was on you at this point. You're also used to the money. And then I continued to do the robberies. And then on the 13th of March, 
we went and done a robbery at uh, Rains Park uh, train station. Um, Twenty-seven thousand uh, pound from the station the train station was robbed, and ended up getting caught. And that's when everything kind of changed. I remember I was hiding. Um, I was a gateway driver. I went with two young people. We, we robbed the, the train station, we making our way back home. Um, as I got to Wimbledon, uh, Wimbledon area, um, I think someone had spotted a car. A police officer started walking towards the car. I didn't know it was a police officer at first. He's walking, walking, walking. All of a sudden, he's trying to open my door. Like, police, open up. Then I sped, hit the car in front of me, ran around, drove. And what I used to do, um, I always used to wear dark clothing as overalls, but underneath I'd wear sort of bright coloured coat clothing or sort of like a football jersey, whatever. So my whole thing was that if I had to discard my clothes and all of a sudden they're looking for someone dark clothing, but now I've got bright coloured clothing and I'm running in football gear, they stop me, I'm like, oh no, I'm just a jogger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I see how you was thinking, my boy. <laughs> They, 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 that, did that work? That was my kind of plan. But anyway, I... Re- Still a big black dude. Like, they, you know. Ran um, into some garden and hid there for ages. I remember there was a police um, helicopter up and down. And in my head, I was like, oh, my miss is going to be... I was meant to go and pick her up. But I thought, let me just stay here. <laughs> and at one point, I could hear that snuffling or something like sniffling on the like, dog I thought, oh, don't tell me there's a dog in this garden and i looked up and there's a police officer of his radio and he threw his dog over and i literally ran into the back of the garden of the house there was a woman in there with her daughter and she screamed because just imagine this big six foot two guy just running inside your house at this point i should have just given up i don't know what i thought i was doing i ran upstairs and barricaded myself in the in the, one of the bedrooms of the bathroom i can't remember and they're like open up open up and i'm trying to use all my strength. I'm like, really, truly, where the hell am I going? But then they broke in the door. The officer gave me one punch. I think that's the hardest punch I've ever felt. Like, hit me to the floor. And they just started beating the shit out of me. And I always used to like, say, I'm going to sue the police. I mean, and then they had their dog, like this big rock rattler. Like, my arm is all, like, even to this day, I've got all the scars. And this was like the big puncher there. Like, the dog was just chewing my arm. And like, was, I'm like, the dog's chewing me, chewing me. He's biting me. They're like, shut up. They're kicking me. And I always thought, I'm going to sue the police for this. But I thought, actually, end of the day, you run into someone's house. The police don't know if you've got weapons or not. So their first thing is, let's protect this family. So by every means, they had the right to, to, to beat me up. But then I went to, um, they took me to the police station. They had to take me to the hospital to get a tetanus jab. Then went to the... Um, went to um, court the next day and then I was reminded. They told me, I'm like, reminded? I thought I was going to get bail. They're like, nah, you're being reminded. Bail? Bail? You ain't getting bail, buddy. You just did a whole $27,000 robbery, took the police on a chase, broke in and entering a woman's crib, barricaded yourself in the bathroom, got beat up by the police, bit by the dog, you know what I'm saying? It's over. <laughs> I broke down in tears. I never cried so much. I was like, I was hyperventilating. I was like, what do you mean? You can't, they said, you're going to felt him. I was like, and at this point, you're hearing all this violence that goes on. In- HM Prison felt him, a young offenders institution for boys and young men aged 15 to 21. I was like, how has my life turned out like this? I was intelligent in school. I was in the top set. I was good at football. I just signed for Ashford Town. What am I doing going into prison? I just couldn't sort of fathom, like, what have you done with your life? Literally a product of his environment. Literally. You had all that going for you, but your environment dragged you down. It, like, this is what I be hearing all the time. If you put yourself, if you're, even if you're a billionaire, <laughs> if you're a billionaire and you take the chance, you take the moment to surround yourself with people people that's robbing and stealing and partying, you're gonna go down. You can't bring all them people up, but you're gonna seep down to their level and be on that same mental playground as them, no matter what. That's why sometimes it's good to separate yourself and grow up, man. You can't, you gotta cut them old roots. Simple. They gave me like two or three different sentences which all together end up me being in prison for eight years. Damn! Just kind of speak about your experience of being in prison? Yeah, I mean, uh, prison was tough in regards to 
just being away from your friends and family and not being able to do the things you wanted to do. You can see people going out and enjoying themselves and just stuck in yourself, especially in the summer. I was always quite entrepreneurial. So um, every prison I went to, I was kind of the, the go-to guy. I opened up a... Remember, you don't have to, but if you don't want to see ads, sub up. Betting shop and a bookies and uh, a casino. And the casino was the big money maker, man. Um, I used to have a blackjack table and literally I would loan you, we used to make, um, you can buy sort of arts and crafts sort of um, pieces and we used to get the matchsticks um, and that would be the chips. So I'll loan you maybe 50 pound worth of chips. Each chip costs five pound. And all you had to do was give me back my chips and it, whatever you got on top, that's your profit kind of thing. So that's how I kind of kept myself occupied while I was in prison, but I also studied. So I went and done a um, degree in criminology and social policy, which was funded by the Open University. And that taught me a lot about myself and about, about my environment. And by the time you got released eight years later, how do you think you'd changed as a person? Yeah, so um, I was released on the 24th of February uh, 2015. And I said, So you've been out eight years? What can I do to make sure I don't go back to jail? First thing, don't hang around with the same people you used to hang around with. Duh, that's number one. Because I looked at it like these people didn't visit you in prison, they didn't send you money. So why are you going to go back and hang around with these people that forgot about you? Secondly, spend more time with my family. They always do. It's probably like one or two people that are probably keeping contact for the first year or two. But then after that, it's like maybe one. Like, the hood don't love you as much as you love the hood. Trust it. Mm -mm. Right, because the more you spend time with your family, the more you don't want to be away from them. And thirdly, it was just about trying to be legit. I didn't want, I know, I knew I didn't want to go and work for someone, but I'd made plans. But initially, you come out of prison, you're broke. I was making a lot of money in prison. I've come out of prison now. I can't make money. I can't go and open up a shop or a betting shop or a, a bookies. So um, I literally went and done a night shift at a bagel factory called Mr. Bagels in Hackney Wick. And I remember just working there, using that money to fund the football club. We used to go out fundraising with buckets outside of Tesco's. I remember a company called Age Group was buying Mr. Bagels. I approached them and said, look, I've just come out of prison. I used this uh, job to fund my football club. Then he started sponsoring the football club. Then he put me in a salary because I was good at marketing and getting my story out there. And through the back of that, um, he put me in a £28,000 a year salary, like a year after coming out of jail. And then just build up the football team over and over again. Sometimes that's all it be taking is somebody to trust in you. Somebody to see the, the division that you got. Somebody to see the change that you've made. You know what I'm saying? As a result of... His fundraising efforts, Bobby funded Hackney's Wicks FC in East London. Since 2015, it has been a community football hub for young people and adults. Just knowing how I was as a, as a young person, knowing that I was so good at football, I had opportunities and I messed it up. I didn't want the young people to follow in that journey. So what more than provide them with a platform and with lived experience and say, you know what, you guys don't have to do this because I went through this. This is a different angle. And for young people, how do you think sport or being part of like a football club can impact their life positively? I mean, sport for me is a unifier. Like for example, right, we're in Hackney Wick, right, and we provide football for the whole borough. We've got young people who come from Homerton, from Dalston, from Hackney Wick, from London Fields, from Stoke Newton. All these areas don't get along. They don't get along at all where we bring them all together to come and play football and hoping to build that familiarity. God forbid later on in life, they're both kind of joining gangs, right? That can save their lives, because if there's an issue, someone say, all right, nah, nah, leave him alone, man. I used to play football with him when I was eight at Hackney Wick. I know his mum. So that familiarity can also sometimes aid, but also just the opportunity that we provide, like, for example, uh, the tournament I run every year, the 32 Barrel Cup. London has 32 boroughs. World Cup has 32 teams. So my whole ethos was, why can't I bring all these young people from London together who don't know each other, who are scared to go to neighboring boroughs just because of these fake borders? They say, actually, you guys could be friends. I have all- You know what that did? Like, that remind me of basketball in Chicago does that for a lot of kids. You know what I'm saying? I, I knew so many people just from hooping. It helps when you're good at it too, but like, yeah.
over 25 people that I know. Stopped a lot of issues, too, though, because you would see random people on the street, like, yo, 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 I'm like, no, 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 I know him, chill out. <laughs> you know. Or that being killed. Some of them didn't reach the age of 16. Some of them didn't reach the age of 18. Some never 21. Some of them never got to go on holiday, didn't get to experience having children. My daughters are like my best friends. And if I never had them, I don't know how, where I would be, what would motivate me. So you, you, That's a fact. And I think with young people, you guys forget that gang um, era that you have, age, is only between 18 to about 24. That's a small segment of your life. You still got to reach 40, you still got to reach 50, you still got to reach 60. You're not going to be a gang member at 60, are you? So the main thing is that don't risk your life for this small period of your life when there's so much more life to live. Talk about it, Bobby. W. Bobby, man. TLL, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. I'm gone.